undefeated. He, he runs because we are your spiritual sons and daughters. So give us that joy, an impartation of joy tonight. As the word goes forth, I pray, Lord God, and we'll continue to just stir up this thing that you have for us, Lord God, to enter into the new thing that you're doing. This is Resurrection Sunday, and we've just stepped out of the grave of where we were before, and we're stepping into the new level of glory that you have for us tonight. In Yeshua's name we pray, amen and amen. So really the enemy of our soul, right, Satan himself, wants to steal our joy, which is one of the fruits of the Holy Spirit. Why? Because the joy of the Lord is our strength. See? So if he could begin to, to, to come against that joy, right, you become weakened, and you can't stand. So, and I'll get into this more, but the fruit of the Spirit has a divine order to it. Love, right? To love the Lord that God with all your heart, with all your, with all your mind, your strength, right? And to love your brethren as you love yourself. But the number two one is joy. So if you don't have love, you're not going to have joy. But if you don't have joy, you're not going to have peace, and you just keep going down the fruit of the Spirit. You need each one of those in the divine order to get the next one. So what does the enemy come to steal? He comes to steal our joy. That's an attack. This whole COVID thing was an attempt to bring fear, right, to steal our joy. And the Lord wants us to be joyful because he's joyful. He sees things in a different way. He sees, right, what happened in the beginning, but he sees what's going to happen in the end. And we're victors. We're victors. And I said that this morning, for every cross you face, for everything that comes against you, for every cross you face, you need to look beyond the cross because here's the resurrection. So when these things are being confronted to us, it's a place where we could die to self and step into the new creation that he wants us to be. He's already looking at us, by the way through the nail-pierced hands of his son from heaven the Father. And he sees you complete. He sees you as the new creation we are in the process of becoming. And so we need to understand that. So there's a, there's a scripture. Even when there's a difficult time you're going through, we must realize that it's only for a season. First Peter 6, 1 and 6, uh, 6 says, Wherein you greatly rejoice... Though now for a season, if need be, you are in heaviness through manifold temptation. So he's talking to people that are going through some issues. He says, wherein you greatly rejoice, but now you're going through some heavy things. And it says um, that the trial of your faith, being much more precious than of gold that perishes, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Yeshua, the Messiah. So what he's saying is the trial you're going through is to take away things in your life that need to go. They're the old nature. They're the things that you've been holding on to. He wants us to move from one level of glory to the next. He wants us to be perfected in him. Okay, so the, we're, not, we're, not a, we're not a sitting target. We're a moving target, but we're in a moving target to get to the next level of his glory, right? And then it says, whom having not seen, you love. That means we're not, we don't necessarily have a, see Jesus, but we know he's there seated at the right hand of the Father. You love him, in whom though, you, we, though now you see him not, yet believing here, you rejoice with joy unspeakable, full of glory. Yeah. So this is a thing that we need to get into, this thing of rejoicing in the Lord, right? And it's with joy unspeakable, full of glory. See, when you're in your prayer time, when you're in your closet, when you begin worshiping, this is a time that we begin to do this. You rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory, receiving the end of your faith, even the salvation of your souls. So many times it is people who are bringing persecution and being used by Satan to try our faith and to steal the fruit of the Spirit, especially our joy. But God gives us wisdom in his word on how to handle such persecution. So we read in Romans 12, 14, and 15, 
bless them which persecutes you. Bless and curse not. So it's saying, don't get into a thing, because you start getting into an angry spirit. These people are coming to you, motivated by Satan to get you upset and angry, to take you off track from being with him, being yoked to Yeshua, being in in fellowship with Yeshua, right? Walking moment by moment with him. The minute that enemy comes, he's, he brings somebody that's angry, whatever, he's trying to get you into their spirit. He's trying to get you so upset that you begin to curse that person. But he wants you to see that you need to bless him. What does it mean to bless someone who's cursing you? It means you start praying for them to see the light. You, you pray for the Holy Spirit to be the hound of heaven, to compel them to come in. You pray for them to receive salvation. See, they want you to curse them because the enemy wants him, that person, to go to hell. But when you start praying against what the enemy wants for that person, you'd be surprised what he begins to do. Right? Yeah. I have a sister here that I know she's been going through a ton, ton of stuff, and she's been praying for even those who had come against her. Right? Sister right back here, she's told me I mean, it's tons of times. I met, her, I met her in Israel, Terry in Israel, and I remember what she was going through and how she just keeps going after God and keeps, and keeps blessing those, praying for those who have persecuted her. And that's the key. So we need to learn how to do that. So we rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with them that weep. Okay. So there's a scripture there we're very familiar with, right? Rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. In many places of fellowship, we skip over the first thing. The first part is to rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. Who, are, who is God talking to, okay? When he says rejoice with those who rejoice, he's talking to those who are suffering, who are weeping. He's saying, I want to tell you something. You, who are going through these tr this trial, you need to begin to rejoice with those who rejoice. Now, the ones who are rejoicing, they're told, be cognizant of those who are going through suffering. Weep with those who weep. But it's not that we're supposed to commiserate with them. I remember growing up as a teenager, going through problems, you know? And it's always like you like to put on the sad songs, you know? It's my party and I'll cry if I want to, you know? <laughs> Some of you remember those songs? <laughs> then there was Nina Simone. Uh -oh. Nina Simone, she sang all the depressing songs, you know? <laughs> I mean, you want to have a pity party, listen to Nina Simone. My uncle wrote a song. The last song he wrote it became a hit song before he went home to be with the Lord, my uncle Saul Marcus. And he wrote this song for Nina Simone. And the song was, Baby, do you understand me now? And it's about, I'm just a soul whose intention is good. Oh, Lord, please don't let me be misunderstood. But when you hear Nina Simone sing it, it's depressing. Because she sings it, but that's the way he wrote it. He wrote it like, oh, Lord, and she's crying, you know. But then that song was done by the Animals, a British group, and it became a hit song. And it was dun, 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 dun. They sped it up. And they said, baby, do you understand me now? And it was like a whole different thing, you know. But then, this was the day that he died. I was walking the streets of New York. And as I'm walking down the streets, they had these record shops, and they're blasting out this song by Santa Esmeralda. It was like a group that was like, had a Hispanic sound. And it was the whole side of an LP, Don't Let Me Be Misunderstood. And it was like celebrating, and it was like dancing. And it was, it was crazy. And I was going, I went into the shop and said, what is that? And they go, that's the latest song, Santa Esmeralda. And I go, that's my uncle's song. He just went home to be with the Lord. So it was like this song became the greatest hit after he went home to be with the Lord. But the key I'm trying to get to you is this is what we got to avoid is, is having that pity party. See, we need to get out. When we're going through these things, you need to get with another brother and sister who are celebrating, 
who have the, who've been through the thing you've been through, but they have victory. Because you need to break the yoke of what the enemy is trying to do for you. And, you know, this is what I'm saying, is that he wants to isolate you. He wants to get you away. He wants you to feel bad for yourself. He wants you to go, oh, woe is me. And I understand what you're going through, but this is, this is really a command. Rejoice with those that do rejoice. That's to the weeping people. That's to the people going through heavy. And weep with those. Let us be cognizant when we have victory to search out those people who are going through things to say, hey, what's going on with you? What's happening? And they start telling you, you say, well, let me tell you something. I've been through it. God wants you to know that you're going to be okay. Can I pray with you? Yeah. Right? So really, it's, we, we go through this thing. It's like a car, man. And it's like when we check our oil in the car, because when the dipstick is low, we need to receive an, a, an infilling of oil. So the car operates. Well, we need the joy of the Lord. We need his Holy Spirit to come in the fullness of joy when we're going through these things. So, Father, I just pray for that joy to begin to trickle down from heaven right now on us, Lord God. Joy unspeakable, full of glory. We just pray through this whole thing. We're going to be praying for more and more levels of joy. Philippians 4, 4 says, rejoice. This is a command. Rejoice in the Lord always. Wait a minute. Rejoice in the Lord always. Okay, that means in the good times and the bad times? Yep, always. And in case you don't understand what he's saying, he says, and again I say rejoice. I mean, Paul is like saying, come on, do you get this command from the Lord? He's saying rejoice in him always because we realize who we are, especially this Resurrection Sunday. We understand that we have been, we have been, Born into the kingdom as at such a time, we're sons and daughters, spiritual sons and daughters of the Most High God. We have something to rejoice on. We know that he has good things for us, right? He's a loving father. And then I love this in 1 Thessalonians 5, 16 and 18. Rejoice evermore. He's saying this is, this is for everlasting. You're going to have joy everlasting life. This is going to be for all eternity. Start doing it now. Get used to it, right? Pray without ceasing. So he's saying, man, you just need to get in a conversation. Prayer isn't, oh Lord thy God, I cometh before you, you know, again. No, it's conversation with the Lord. It's like Brother Lawrence. I don't know if you read his book, Practicing the Presence of God. He was a monk that just, he got into a conversation with the Lord. He was running the kitchen in, in a monastery. And he had a hard, and you know, you women that, that run kitchen, run the, the family in terms of food and all that stuff, especially when it's holidays and all, you know what it's like, right? He was just learning to just moment by moment converse with God. And, and, and any thought that entered in that wasn't of him, he just took it down, and he perfected that. So this is what he's talking about, and everything begin to give thanks. That's the good and the bad. Give thanks to the Lord. I thank you, Lord, that, I'm, that this thing is coming against me because you're going to take some stuff out of me that needs to go, and I'm going to die to these things that I need to die to because you're taking me into the next level of your glory, right? And for this is the will of God in Messiah Jesus concerning you. That's his will for us to grow, to us to become sanctified, right? Not cranktified. I met a lot of cranktified Christians, not sanctified Christians. You know, cranktified Christians are those who are in bad mood, you know? It's like they want to, stop bothering me now. I'm reading my word, <laughs> you know? <laughs> we want sanctified, right? So you're going to experience criticism and persecution for your faith no matter whether you walk in joy and celebration of God, or whether you fast and you're praying or crying out in desperation to God. So why not celebrate instead of vegetate? Right? right? Yeah. Really. Yeshua said to the Pharisees who criticized him and his Talmudim, his disciples, for celebrating life instead of being like John the Baptist, preaching repentance and practicing the Nazarite vow. You know that that's what John was into, the Nazarite vow. He couldn't cut his hair. Right, he couldn't drink strong drink. He ate locust and honey. He, his beard was grown long. He looked like a hippie, right? And all these people had to come in the wilderness to this wild man in Borneo. I don't know why I said Borneo, but anyway, it was in Jordan. 
But he was in the desert, man. You, you, you weren't going to the temple. You weren't going to some nice, beautiful place. You had to go and get to the desert. Jordan, if you have, how many have been to Israel? So you know, you've been to Jordan. You know what it looks like over there in that area. So, so this is what I'm talking about is that this is, this is, so John the Baptist was talking about repentance. He was preparing the way, right, for the coming of the Messiah. And so um, Matthew 11, 17 and 11 and 18 says, and saying, we have piped unto you. This is Yeshua talking. And you have not danced, right? We have mourned unto you, and you have not lamented. For John came neither eating nor drinking, and they say he had a devil. And then you go into 1119. The Son of Man came eating and drinking, and they say, Behold, a man gluttonous, a wine-bibber, a friend of, of publicans and sinners. But wisdom is justified of her children. So John the Baptist took the vow of the Nazarite, right? He's fasting, abstaining from celebration. He was a very serious man. And what happened to him? He lost his head. But Yeshua came eating, celebrating, and he was crucified. Okay, here's the thing. I remember John Arnott from Toronto said this. He says, you're going to die one way or the other. So if you're going to go out, why don't you go out celebrating the Lord? Because you're just moving on to the next level of what God has for you, eternal life with him, right? But you see, the enemy wants to keep us with our face. Now, even in great revivals, people go, okay, Warren, now wait about these great revivals. There was altar calls like the Great Awakening, Brownsville Revival. There are people running to the altar. But here's the deal. When you are dealing with things before the Lord and you come before him and you repent, the repentance isn't you're staying on the floor commiserating over. It's to repent of something you get set free and you could celebrate. So when you're dealing with sin and you confess sin to the Father, 1 John 1 and 9, it says, confess your sin. He is faithful and just to forgive you your sin and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. And if you're still struggling with something, you've been there several times, that's okay. Just say, Lord, give me the power of your Holy Spirit upon to overcome in this area. Right. And I know he's done that so many times to me, and then God reveals another area i got to confess and repent of, right? Yeah. But I'm not staying there, okay? I'm not allowing the enemy to put me there. I confess it, it's done, it's nailed to the cross, Right, I'm looking backward to what Jesus did on the cross for me. It is finished. My confession is laying it out there that I recognize it so I could go on and pick up my cross and walk. He didn't, remember it doesn't say in the scriptures, hang on the cross like Jesus hanging on the cross. He said, pick up your cross and follow me. The cross is so you could die to self. Right, but there's also the resurrection that we enter into. Every time we confess, we're entering into the resurrection, into the new level of glory. Does that make sense? Yes. So behold, a gluttonous and wine-bibber, a friend of publicans and sinners, but wisdom is justified of the children. Now, in Mark 2, 15, and it came to pass that as Yeshua, Jesus sat at meat in his house, many publicans and sinners sat also together with Yeshua and his disciples, for there were many, and they followed him. And when the scribes and Pharisees saw him eat with publicans and sinners, they said unto his disciples, How is it that he eats and drinks with publicans and sinners? When Yeshua Jesus heard it, he said unto them, They that are whole have no need of the physician, but they are sick. I came not to call the righteous, but the sinners to repentance. You see, Jesus preached in the synagogue. He did. He, he actually preached in the synagogue. If you go to Israel, you can see Capernaum where it was Peter's mother-in-law's house is there, and he would go in Capernaum. He hung around a lot in, in Galilee, and he would just speak in the temple, in the, in the synagogue. But he also, he realized that there was resistance there. He would go to the lost sheep of Israel who were in the streets, the ones who were hurting you know, the ones who were, who were brokenhearted. He wanted to minister to them because they're open. Let me tell you something. God is going to use you to minister to many different people. There's some with hardened hearts and all that, 
But I want to tell you something. It's really when people come to the end of themselves that they're ready to come. So when you're sowing in, when I was, um, I was Jewish and I didn't know Yeshua, God put in my path for seven years. I went to School of Visual Arts for film. While I was there, there was this one Catholic guy who had an anti-abortion stand, Richie Gallagher. And I would just, there was the, in Port Authority, New York, they had the John Birch Society, Jews for Jesus. They had all these different stands where they would give out their information. It was kind of like a marketplace of ideas. And I would just go from table to table to argue with them. I kind of liked it. It was kind of fun, you know. So I would give, I would give uh, Richie Gallagher the hardest time because I was saying, no, it's a woman's right to choose. And also, I was just repeating everything I thought, you know, as a liberal, I was a liberal. I was like, I was a radical, you know, anti-war protester, hair down to here, you know. So I would tell him this stuff. And I would say, even though I knew better, I would say, the Bible was just written by men. He goes, you're Jewish and you don't understand that the Bible is inspired by God himself. And he says, Warren, at least you have the right God, right? <laughs> but you need to know that you're Messiah. And so he got me into getting the Bible and reading the Bible. And he got me into looking at things. And he would, he would share certain things with me. Over seven years, he had a deal with me. So he kept sewing in and sewing in. I was a tough cookie. But when I finally came... A lot of it was because he kept talking to me. I never gave him the satisfaction that he was ever right. So there's people that you're witnessing to, and God's called you to witness to. They may not be saying to you, yeah, you're right over there. I'm telling you, when I would be on my home, going home on the bus, I would fall asleep. And as I was waking up, this one thing that he might have said goes, wow, you know what? That's right. So it was breaking my, my whole rebelliousness. It was doing that. You have to understand when you're talking to people that you're dealing heavy with, be bold. Speak those things. They may not be listening to you or tell you that, but they, the word does not return void. And so somebody else got the harvest when I came in, Pastor Tate, right, in the Assemblies of God Church where I finally publicly gave my heart to the Lord. But that man, I tried to hunt him down to find out where he was to thank him and I couldn't find him. Who knows, he could have been an angel, right? But this is what I'm talking about. So we need to understand that, um, that we, we have this, this thing in us. Now it says, and the disciples of John, in Mark 2.18, and the disciples of John and of the Pharisees used to fast, and they came and said unto him, why do the disciples of John and the Pharisees fast, but your disciples fast not? They're asking the question, right? And Yeshua answered them and said, Can the children of the bride chamber fast while the bridegroom is with them? As long as they have the bridegroom with them, they cannot fast. When we have Yeshua in us. See, it's hard because we have his presence by the indwelt Holy Spirit, you see? And so we're, when we fast, we fast for certain reasons. It's okay. But we're not showing, oh, man, what's going on, brother? Oh, I was fasting for 40 days, you know. <laughs> no, you're not supposed to be showing that you were fasting. You're fasting to get through something, but you're, you're to emote the joy of the Lord, right? Because you're out there representing, but you're saying, God, just give me the joy. And if you know, if you've been through a fast, man, sometimes it's hard, but there is something you're getting. You're getting revelation. You're getting revelation from God that you didn't have before because the resistance that you had of the flesh is being broken down through the fast. So Yeshua ushered in something for the people of God to be joyful for, the good news, celebration of being born again as sons and daughters of the Most High God, knowing that Yeshua came to give us abundance and fullness of joy. John the Baptist shared his calling by Jehovah God as opposed to the calling of Yeshua, the Messiah, to come. Matthew 3, 7, and 8. But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees come to his baptism, he said to them, O generation of vipers. You imagine, here's these Pharisees coming there to check him out. Because they know something's going on, and they're saying, wait a minute, where are these people? They're not coming to the temple for mikvah. Mikvah is baptism. Okay, there were baptism pools all around the temple for you to go in and get baptized. 
And baptism wasn't just like a one-time thing. Baptism was before you went in, the priests would wash themselves, right, with water. So anyone that was going to enter the temple, they would go into the baths and just get right with God. And they actually, the Orthodox Jews still call it being born again. So they have these pools of water, these places where mikvah, and it's running, it has to be running water, fresh water, but they're in pools. And they go in there naked. Men go in, you know, alone as a man, and women go in with women attending as women. They go in naked like, like being born from God again. So they deal with God, and they want to come into a deeper relationship. They also have for women... Every time an Orthodox woman menstruates, they have to go in to the mikvah. I'm talking about ultra-Orthodox. The reason is because the promise of life passed through them. It's not like to put a woman down, but it's because the, the object of understanding this is because a woman passed through the potential of having another child, and it passed through them. The egg passed through them. So this is a cleansing thing, like to get ready for the next cycle. It's very spiritual in terms of its implications, okay? I'm not saying to do that, but it does mention in the Bible, if you get into it, it says of baptisms, plural. So I believe that really the tradition, since the early church was Jewish, they would continue to go in mikvah pools. They got baptized after salvation, right? They were fully immersed and Romans talks about the fact that we identify with Christ in his death, and we are resurrected with him in newness and life. That's what it represents. It's an outward symbol, right, of what has already occurred inwardly through faith in Jesus. But the idea is there'd be other times that people would go into the mikvah pools to just, get, to just bring something before the Lord and just experience it again. Okay, so... Um, so here's these, these, these Pharisees coming. He ain't too nice to them, right? He said, who hath warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Bring forth, therefore, fruits meet for repentance. And think not to say within yourselves, we have Abraham our father, the pride. For I say unto you that God is able of these stones to raise up children unto Abraham. So he's, he's, he's saying that these people who you look down upon, who are children of Israel, who have come for baptism to repent, he says, don't look down upon them. You think you're like the special superior group, right? And then he says, I indeed baptize you with water and unto repentance, but he that comes after me is mightier than I, whose shoes I am not worthy to bear. He shall baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire right? So he's telling them, so Jehovah God was waiting for this very day when his people would be celebrating the goodness of the Lord. Psalm 66.1, make a joyful noise unto the Lord, all ye lands. See, this is a command. This is commands that the Lord says, dance before me. He doesn't say, when you, when this, now I like the song, when the spirit of the Lord is upon my heart. I will dance like David dance. But it's really not scriptural because it's a command. It's not when you feel like the Lord has finally moved. Oh, when the Spirit of the Lord is upon my heart, I'll pick up my Bible and start reading it. <laughs> when the Spirit of the Lord is upon my heart, I'll go to fellowship. It's not what it is. See, we're commanded to do things to break the yoke of oppression. Dance before the Lord. When you start dancing before the Lord, you may not feel like dancing, but you physically begin to dance and worship God. Many of you say, well, I can't do that in the public. Well, do it at your home and start dancing before the Lord and be crazy. Just dance and see yourself dancing on the head of the devil himself, yeah. right? I love that song we used to sing in, 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 in uh, when this, what is that song in, in Brownsville? We'd sing... Oh, gosh, I'm trying to think of it where we dance. We dance on the enemy's head. No, it's, it's I can't remember the song. It, it's a great song. It, I'll, I'll, it'll come back to me. But it's like dancing before. So you need to see yourself doing these things, see? This is when you start entering back into the joy, okay? So this is like he's saying, 
He's saying, um, make a joyful noise unto the Lord. It's saying, okay, devil, get out of my life. And you go, I love you, Lord. Praise you, Jesus. You just start like laughing and praising him and worshiping him. I'm going to tell you something. The devil will disappear. He just flees from that, okay? So this is a warfare thing. This is a tool of warfare that God has given you. So if you are in the midst of a trial, remember that your salvation, your deliverance is moments away. Your tears are prophesying your future, okay? So what you do is a prophecy to where you're going to be. See, many of us going through different things. We may have family issues and stuff like that. We may have spouses that aren't walking with God. We may have all kinds of things, children. We need to not give up. We need to walk in the things of the Lord. Don't say, oh, well, I better not act a certain way because it might offend them. No, you just go after God because you're going after God as prophesying of their future. Right? And when they go through something, and they will, who are they going to go to? When somebody starts facing a disease, right, who are they going to call? to pray for them. They're going to call you. That crazy uncle, that crazy mom, that crazy dad, that, I'm going to call them because, because they do believe God. And I'm no testimonies of people that have said this, that their children who were very disobedient, when they finally came to a real crisis in their life, they call mama, they call dada, they call, they call someone they know who's on fire for God. That's why we need to be in that Mix with God. We need to be walking with God in that thing and not let the enemy take us away from having that victory that we have. And we have this weapon of warfare, the commands of the Lord to begin to dance before him, to shout in joy before him, right? Yeah. Um, it says in Psalm 126, 5 and 6, they that sow in tears shall reap in joy. This is a promise. Somebody that's weeping and you start ministering to, I've been through this thing. Let me tell you something. You're sowing in tears right now, but I want to tell you something. You're going to be reaping in joy. And you know what that's really talking about? It's like harvest. You water. Okay, you're, you're plowing. You water. Okay, it's hard. But you know what's coming is the harvest. Because you did your part, and God's going to do his part. Does that make sense? He that goes forth and weeping... Bearing precious seed shall doubtless come again with rejoicing, bringing his sheaves with him. You see, it's a vision of bringing the sheaves of the harvest and waving them before the Lord and thanking him for what he has done. Right? So Yeshua has ushered in gr the great exchange. If you begin walking in sync, in yoking yourself with um, Jesus, right? You are promised to experience a great exchange. This was in Isaiah 61.3. This is what Yeshua, when he read in the temple, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. This is the rest of the scripture. And it talk, talks to appoint unto them that mourn in Zion to give them beauty for ashes. I love this great exchange. So for the ashes of your life, he wants to give you beauty, right? The oil of joy for mourning. So if you're going through a mourning thing, you're going through a distress thing, he wants to give you the oil of joy. The oil of joy comes from the Holy Spirit. That's being applied and poured over you, right? The garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. Now, why does he do this? Because we're such nice people? No, we've been called to a destiny. It says that you might be called a tree of righteousness by others who see you right? The planting of the Lord so that he might be glorified. So every time you defeat the enemy through using these tools, right? The joy of the Lord, dancing before him. This is, you're defeating the enemy and you're giving glory to the Father. And he's rejoicing with you. And he's going to pour more upon you. See? So that's, you got to break the yoke of that oppression. You got to break that yoke of that attack. And then what happens is he starts pouring his joy on you. He starts pouring his freedom on you. His victory is healing. This is what I'm talking about. This is like, this is like incredible stuff that he wants to do, right? The kingdom of Jehovah God goes far beyond the temporal things of the world. It, um, the world counts so many things important that are not important to God. Look at the TV commercials advertising the best foods, entertainment, ways to invest, clothes to buy, houses, cars, etc. 
But none of these outward things can truly make us happy. It might make you happy for a season, but all of them could be stolen. They, they, they start breaking down, right? Like a new car isn't new after a period of time. You start saying, well, maybe I should get another car, right? Brother over here, he, he gets the old cars and restores the cars. <laughs> so Jehovah God wants to give us something money can't buy. For the kingdom of heaven, it says in Romans 14, 17, for the kingdom of God is not meat and drink, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. Right? So how do we get that peace? The joy of the Lord into our lives, back in our lives when we are despair and sadness, right? Here's what Yeshua said. I am the door, John 10, 9. I am the door. If by me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved and shall go in and out and find pasture. That's a promise. You need to dig back into that to, to, to the Lord. You need to get, when you're going through these things, most often we have drifted away from being yoked to Yeshua. And that's when you get picked off. It's like the lone sheep that, that drifts off. The shepherd wants to gather you in again. Okay? He wants you to be in the flock. He wants you to be in the house of God. So you just need to go. You go before the Father, say, forgive me, Father, for what I've done. Right? First John 1 and 9, he's, he cleanses you. He restores you. Right? You're back in yoke with God. It's that quick. So keep short accounts. Don't let things go and mount up. When you, when, you, when you know you're in this place and you're not feeling the joy, just start, just start saying, God, I just, I just want to be in you. And I talked about calling down for more of God's Spirit upon you. Just give me more, Lord. I need more. See, you, one of the things of the Spirit within is that when people say, you have received everything you need, right, when you were saved and you had got the Spirit within. One of the hard parts of that is that sometimes you confuse that with self-effort. So therefore, there's no, I can't call upon the Lord. You know, I can't ask him for more because I got everything I need. I remember this Baptist preacher was preaching this thing about the glory and talking about the glory is going to come. And it's going to be coming upon the earth and all this stuff. And then he got into this thing. But you received everything you need. He just killed the whole, there was like an anointing as he was talking about the glory. Because all he had to do was start praying for the glory to come. Well, I just pray for the glory. Your holy, your glory, Father, the manifest presence of you, Father, to come down upon us right now. I just pray for your Holy Spirit to come and pour out more of you upon us that we we might begin to sense your closeness, your presence, Lord God. We just want more of you and less of us. And if you have, if you have the real guts to pray, I want all of you and none of me, Lord. Lord, I just want it all, Lord God. I just want a mighty outpouring. Just, just receive right now. Father, we just receive right now more of you. Lord God, we know you want to restore us. You want to bring us into a new place in you. You want to bring us into having that experience of your presence, your joy. Lord God, your peace and all of the fruit of the Spirit. So, Father God, we just ask right now that you come. We need to be refreshed right now. We need a mighty rain upon our trees. We're called trees of righteousness, but we need a rainstorm to come. We need our, our, our leaves to be cleansed. We need the fruit to be cleansed from all of the stuff that the earth, the, the world, the flesh, and the devil tries to put dirt upon the fruit even. So we just, we just pray for your washing right now. Just wash us clean right now, Lord God, and renew us, Lord God. And, and in our reservoirs of the Holy Spirit within, just, just, just put more of your spirit, just stir up the spirit within, Lord God, that, that these fruits become evident. And Lord God, it's luscious that we have a garden that's planted by you, that's fully with fruit of the harvest, Lord God. See, we could have fruit trees, but they're barren. So, Lord, we want fruit trees that are full of luscious fruit, Lord God, that you have put already these trees in us, in your garden within us, but we need that rain to come, Father, in Yeshua's name, in Yeshua's name. Thank you, Lord. So, the key is Yeshua is the door into a relationship with God. And when we become born again through repentance, then embracing by faith Yeshua as our Messiah and Lord, there's our intimate personal relationship with our Messiah that is important. But there's more. How many of you have had an encounter with the Ruach HaKodesh, the Holy Spirit? 
where he comes upon you in such power, right? If you haven't encountered relationship and fellowship with the Holy Spirit, then you're missing so much. Just ask our daddy, like we just did, for more of his blessed Holy Spirit. There is no toxic level in your relationship with the person of the Holy Spirit. Now, I love this verse of Scripture because it talks about becoming inebriated with the Spirit. Now, not everybody could accept this. They go, well, I don't know about this. But it's right here in the Word, Ephesians 5, 17 through 21. Wherefore, be you not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. And be not drunk with wine, where is in excess, but be filled with the Spirit. So he's talking about there's no toxic level of the Holy Spirit. Now, he's, he's bringing it up for a reason, the wine what does it make you? It makes you intoxicated. He's saying be intoxicated with the Spirit, right? Now here, does this not sound like what happens? Did you ever see a drunk person? They're drunk with wine. They're drunk with strong drink. They start acting funny, right? So he's showing you when you're inebriated by the Holy Spirit, when you're drunk in the Holy Spirit, in essence, you're going to be doing these things that are very much like in the flesh, what these other people are doing. Look, speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns. You ever see these people going, oh, yes, oh, I'm really happy. You know, these are, but you're singing, oh, Lord, my God. When I, I used to remember driving to New York in a truck, man. And I was just, I was in this van taking film equipment to the next shoot. And I'm sitting in there, and I'm singing on top. It had a great echo sound to this van. And I'm going, oh, Lord, my God, when I in awesome wonder consider all thy worlds thy hands have framed, right? And I'm driving, and I'm in traffic, right? And I see this guy, he's like next to me. Right? And I didn't stop. You know, most times you go, well, oh, I, I can't do this. I look like an idiot. And I'm going, oh, you know, and I'm just saying, oh, Lord, thy God, yeah, an awesome wonder. And the guy's like going like this. Some guys got it, and they're going, yeah, yeah, you know what I mean? Well, that's why I had that bumper sticker in the back, you know, about this car may become empty because the rapture is coming or something like that. No, but the idea is it's good to have something on the back. Now, don't have something in the back of your car if you're not going to be nice. <laughs> you know what I mean? If you're not going to lift your hands, but you're going to do something else with your hands to somebody, you want to be a witness for the Lord. But I'm telling you, man, this is what it's talking about, speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs continually, right? singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. So this is drunken people get because they lose their inhibition. We need to lose our inhibition in the spirit. We need to not be so, what would I say, like, like, like conscious of the Pharisees who want to keep us from enjoying God, but you need to just be celebrating God, right? And doing this, and people see you, they go, what is going on with that guy, right? giving thanks always for all things unto God and the Father in the name of Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus the Messiah, submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God. So the key is he's talking about becoming radical for him. You know, he wants us to become radical for him. He wants us to become witnesses of being radical. Let me tell you something. When your family, if you're trying to witness to somebody and you're cranktified instead of sanctified, you know, you're like, uh, uh, all these people doing these things. Uh, uh, you know, you get into that mood. People go, yeah, I don't want what he has. Man, he's, he's grouchy. He's, he's angry and all that. But when you're just, whoo, isn't God good? You know, they might go like this, like, like this guy's weird. But you know what? That makes them jealous to have what you have because they may have known what you went through. They may know that you've gone through a trial, but you're still praising God and you're happy. And they're going to ask you when they're going through something, why is it that you still are happy? Why is it that you're, you're not cursing, you know? Why is it that you still have this? Because I'm filled with the Holy Spirit. I have him overflowing. The Holy Spirit of God is intoxicating. It's, you know, when I used to, I used to smoke the marijuana with my friends before I knew the Lord. You know, and we all thought we were cool and we would take this marijuana and we'd go around a circle, you know, and go, whoa, man, 
this is really cool. You on that same level? Yeah, man, I'm on the same level as you. You know, we all thought we were getting in, we were coming one with God's counterfeit. But man, you talk about communion, man. When we start having communion and we start really getting into what that means, man, we are getting in the same thing. We're getting the same mind of Messiah and we truly are one, right? So you see, the enemy has duplicates for all this, but it brings you into bondage. It brings you into misery. It brings you into poverty. But when you are in God this way, he's going to bring you into victory. Right? You're going to have harvests. You're going to be taking that harvest and you're going to be waving those sheaves before God and man and telling them, man, look what God has done. Look what, that's the song, look what the Lord has done. Look what the Lord has done. Right? He healed my body, touched my mind. He saved me just in time. Oh, I'm going to praise his name. That's it, right? That's what I'm talking about, you see? That's the victory type thing. So you understand what I'm talking about here? So many in the church have established a relationship with two persons of the Elohim, with Yeshua and with the Ruach HaKodesh, the Holy Spirit. But what about the Father? And I talked about this this morning, right? The self-existent one, Yehovah, Yahweh. This is available for us, and this is what the return of Messiah in his second coming is all about the hope of a physical relationship with the Father and the Son. But right now, the greatest joy we can have is being in a spiritual relationship with the fullness of the Elohim. Hebrew word Elohim means the plural name of God. It's the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. A threefold cord cannot be broken. So I'm telling you, when the Father starts breathing his breath into your nostrils and you receive him, his very face comes close to you, and there's an impartation that you will receive of his holiness, his very person, his clarity of thinking. All fear is gone. All wrong thinking is gone. All desire to entertain sin is gone. What comes is a washing of holiness, wholeness, and walking in a new powerful way like never before. This is what I started, as I started understanding that I could have an intimate, supernatural, and experiential relationship with the Father, just as I could have with Jesus, and just like I could have with the Holy Spirit. See, and he gave me this vision once. You know what Jesus said? Think not what you eat. Think not what you are to wear. Because God supplies it even to the creatures in the field and, you know, all that type of thing. And in that it says, it says, don't, it says when you come to the Father, he already knows what you need before you ask. Yeah. And then it says, so therefore seek ye first the kingdom and his righteousness. See, we want to seek the kingdom, and there's a lot of books about the kingdom, but people are getting into seeking for the kingdom. No, you seek the kingdom because the Father is there. You seek the kingdom because Jesus is there. You seek the kingdom because the Holy Spirit is there. So this is what the vision that God gave me. He said, this is really interesting, he showed me this homeless guy walking in New York, and the homeless guy was, he, he needed food badly. He hadn't eaten for two days, and he said, oh God, please provide some money for me to buy some food. And because all these business people and all these people on the streets were just passing him by. All of a sudden, this guy who was a child of God saw him, and he came over to him, and he says, here, take this. So he, thought, he thanked God. He thanked the man. He thanked God. He got a hamburger, was eating it from one of those stands, you know, eating a hamburger, hot dog, whatever. And then the next day, he was out there again. See, he was seeking God's hands and not his face. And then this limo pulled up to him because he said, God, I can't take this anymore. Just take me home. I just want to be in heaven. I can't take this life anymore. I'm tired of this, of just day after day begging, the smell of the streets, the, the things that are going on here in the alleys and all this stuff that I'm seeing. And there was this limo that pulls up to him, and this driver, he was an angel. And he says, get inside. I know you're hungry come and he opens the door for the guy and he's looking at this guy but he looked like a regular guy right so he gets in the car and the limo and he starts driving and says there's some water in the fridge for you 
just take some of that water. So he takes it, he falls asleep, and all of a sudden he's riding in like the Blue Ridge Mountains. It's like the most beautiful scenery, right? And he's going, oh, my gosh, what has happened? I just prayed that I would, you know, go home. Am I dead? You know, and he takes him into this gilded gate, and it opens in this mansion, beautiful, you know, landscaping, and he goes there, and he says, he pulls up, and he goes, the master is in the house, and dinner shall be served. And he takes him in, and all of a sudden, the father comes. And the father starts walking towards him, and he sees him, and he says, welcome to your home. Welcome to your house. And he embraces him, and the man melts in his embrace, the divine embrace of God. The Lord shall keep you. That's what that means. It's a divine embrace where he puts his arms around you in that prayer of the blessing. And he then explains to him things, and he's eating. Then he takes him to this closet. He says, see this closet? This is all things that I have reserved for you, but you could be partaking of it now. You could partake of it in the world. You could, I want to give you some of these things now. These are things not just for the by and by, but for now, but they're reserved in heaven. But you need to know that I have them for you. You don't have to ask. You just need to begin to get into that relationship with me where you're in my presence. You see, he was translated in a moment from the alleyways and the vomit on, the flu on, on New York, the heat and all of that stuff of the summer, to opulence, to this place of beauty, riches of the Father. And the Father said, this is your home. This is where you belong. You're my spiritual son. This is where you belong. Now, you're ready now to go out back into the world to compel others to come in and understand the reality of this, right? So I'm sending you away, but when you get tired, when you get, then just come back, just start speaking to me and just come back to this place. You had a vision of this place. The Father already knows what you need. So here's the deal. When you start spending time with God, see, you're translated in, in heaven. Where heaven is, there is no sickness. Where heaven is, there is no sadness. Where heaven is, there is no lack. So when you begin to intimately get into relationship with God, Jesus, the Father, the Holy Spirit, you start getting an intimacy, right? You, you are receiving, you're in heavenly places. And so the enemy can't even come. But you see, we don't have this in our heads. We don't understand this, this incredible reality that God has for us. Okay, so I'm, I'm getting ready to get through this. How much time are we? We're kind of late, aren't we? We're okay? So here's the thing. So, um, <clears throat> so I'm telling you, when the Father breathes that breath up to your nostrils and you receive him, his very face comes close to you, and there's an impartation that you will receive his holiness. Righteousness, peace, and joy. That's what he wants to give you. It is the enemy of your soul, Satan, who wants to steal your joy, steal your time, your, pre your treasures and talents, and keep you and me in darkness and distress, so much so that we can't enter into a rest. We can't even think right, pray, sing praises when we entertain that state of being. So Yeshua wants us to have joy in abundance. He said, the thief comes not but for to steal and to kill and to destroy. I have come that you might have life and you might have it more abundantly. That's what God wants for you, because you're his child, okay? So we need to understand that and keep that in our mind, right? Now, Yeshua likened himself as a good shepherd who lives and dies for the security and benefit of his flock, John 10, 11. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd gives his life for the sheep. So we have this promise of God. He is watching out for us, and he's the good shepherd, and he wants to watch us. He's looking for even one that wanders off. He's going to go after that one, right? So what do we do when the enemy brings his attack to us and steals our joy? How do we get back into the place Jehovah God has prepared for us? People misunderstand these next scriptures and use them to say God wants you to be in constant state of repentance. Head down to the floor, no laughter, no joy. Suffering is the only way to live. It's the ultimate guilt trip that's given you. I submit to you that the time of grieving mourning is when we are repenting or confessing our sins so that then we can receive God's forgiveness and return to his joy and abundance, and it could be restored.
right? So it says in James 4, 7, and 8, he's talking to sinners, submit yourselves therefore to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners. He's not talking to us doing that as restored children of God. If you're walking with God and you've already repented, he's saying, you sinners, cleanse your hands, right? And purify your hearts, you double-minded, right? And so he also talked about this to in the same thing. Be afflicted and mourn and weep, James 4, 9, and 10. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to heaviness. When? When you're in sin, when you have drifted away, when you have something to confess and repent of, right? Or you're feeling dry and you want to really ask God to come in his presence and fullness. You just say, God, whatever it is that's blocking this, right? Humble yourself in the sight of the Lord, and he shall lift you up. Okay, if he's going to lift you up, what goes away? The mourning, the tears. Are you getting this? This is really important, especially when we're coming out of this COVID stuff, right? So even when the disciples themselves witness Yeshua die on the cross, imagine how hopeless that they that this hopelessness that set in things were so dark things couldn't be any worse when death comes there appears to be no hope but listen to this matthew 28 5 it says and the angel answered and said unto the woman fear not ye for you know that you seek jesus which was crucified he is not here for he is risen as he said Come and see the place where the Lord lied. Now, they weren't, you talk about how upset they were watching him die and put into a tomb, right? And quickly, go quickly and tell his disciples that he is risen from the dead. And behold, he goes before you into Galilee. There you shall see him. Lo, I have told you. And they departed quickly from the sepulcher with fear and great joy and did run to bring and and did run to bring his disciples that word and then it says in 28 9 and 10 and as they went to tell the disciples behold jesus met them saying all hail and they came and held him by the feet and worshiped him and and yeshua said to them be not afraid go tell my brethren that they go into jerusalem into galilee and they shall see me so this is god He's talking about, he's saying, listen, this is, this is at the worst place that they were, and there's joy that came through the resurrection. See, and we're not, we're not to be, we're, the cross is there to remind us of what we have received, but what we received is even more through the resurrection because we received newness of life. Okay, and Luke it talks about getting in a yoke with Yeshua because it's there with him that you shall receive your restoration, your joy, your peace, your healing. He is the door and the entrance way to begin a life of fellowship and the way to begin experiencing the fullness of Elohim, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit in your life. Luke 6, 21, 23. Blessed are you that hunger now, for you shall be filled. Blessed are those that weep now, for you shall laugh. Blessed are ye when men shall hate you and when they shall separate you from their company and shall reproach you and cast out your name as evil for the Son of Man's sake. Rejoice in that day. Don't go, oh, woe is me. Start rejoicing and leap for joy. See, it's a commandment, man. Start rejoicing and leaping for joy. Thank you, Lord. Praise you, Lord. Oh, man, they're coming against me like they came against you. Woo! I must be doing something right. Right? Your reward is great in heaven, for in that like manner did their fathers unto the prophets. So this means you've entered into being a child of God, loved by him, and the world will hate you, but they, will, they can come as you continue to show forth your glory, the glory of God. Right? Now, here's, here's, here's another thing. So here's, we're almost getting to the end here. Yahweh, our Elohim, wants to send us forth tonight out of this place with great joy and with it his great authority and power. It's when we get off of our own situation and begin submitting ourselves to be vessels to demonstrate his kingdom to others that we often experience deliverance from our own tribulation. So we need to get out of ourselves and begin ministering to others. Okay? 
And so God anointed, Jesus anointed these men. They were not yet born again. Right? It's before the cross and resurrection. So he's anointing them as old covenant prophets. And the 70 returned again with joy, saying, Lord, even the devils are subject unto us through thy name. And he said to them, I beheld Satan as lightning falling from heaven. Behold, I give you power to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means hurt you, notwithstanding in this rejoice not that the spirits are subject unto you, but rather rejoice because your names are written in heaven. This is the key. So what are we rejoicing of? That we have eternal life, that we are sons and daughters of the Most High God, right? And then he said to them, go your way, eat the fat. This is, this is Nehemiah. So this is another, this is even in the Old Testament. The holiest of days where, see, people misunderstand the seven feasts, six of them were times of rejoicing, celebrating, eating food, dancing, right? So the most holy one is Yom Kippur, right? The Day of Atonement where they fast. But what do they do after the fast is done in a day? They break the fast and begin celebrating again. It's all celebration. So Nehemiah was, was this is when they started reading the word again to them. The Torah was 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 brought back that they could, and Nehemiah said to them, go your way, eat the fat, drink the sweet, and send portions to those for whom nothing is prepared. For this day is holy to our Lord. Okay, he's saying this is holy to the Lord, so celebrate. Do not sorrow, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. He's saying you need to have the joy of the Lord to be strong in him, to do the things that he wants you to do and accomplish for him, right? You need to be strong in him and his power. So when you find yourself alone and in trouble and can't rise above the situation, get with a brother and sister in the Lord to pray with you, to agree with you. There's no shame in that. We are called to love one another. And that's what Yeshua said. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Remember that Jehovah God wants to give us to what's to have us walk in our new nature, which has been given to us when we were born again. Galatians 5, 22 and 23 says, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness. Again, you have to have love, and then you have to have joy in order to have peace. You have to have peace in order to be long-suffering. You have to have, you have, have long-suffering, the fruit of long-suffering, to be gentle right? You have to, it, and once you're gentle, then you can start having goodness. Read it. It's, it's, like, it's like in the divine order, right? Paul and Silas were locked in a stinky, dark, and cold prison cell, yet they didn't look at their circumstances, but the supernatural joy of the Lord came over them, and it affected every, the very atmosphere of the environment around them. It not only brought deliverance for them, but for the others in prison and for the jailer, their enemy. And you know the story here, Right, Acts 16, 22 and 31, and the multitude rose up together against them, right? And the magistrates rent off their clothes and commanded to beat them. And when they had laid many stripes upon them, they cast them into prison, charging the, jail, the jailer to keep them safely, who having received such a charge, thrust them into the inner prison and made their feet fast in stocks, right? And it says, and at midnight, right? At midnight, Paul and Silas began praying and singing praises unto God. They started just getting imbibed by the Holy Spirit and go, Woo, glory! You know, it was midnight, man. Those other prisoners were shut up! You ever see those prison films? Will you guys just shut up? I'm trying to sleep. But they're just going for it, man. They're just, they're just singing, right? And the prisoners heard them. Suddenly, right, it changed the whole thing, right? It says that suddenly, suddenly there was a great earthquake so that the foundations of the prison were shaken and immediately all the doors were open and everyone's bands were loosed. Oh my gosh. Just, don't you love it? And all the bands were loosed. 
And the keeper of the prison, awaking out of his sleep and seeing the prison doors open, he drew out his sword and would have killed himself, supposing that the prisoners had fled. But Paul cried out with a loud voice, saying, Do thyself no harm, for we are all here. Right? And then he called for a light and sprang in and came trembling and fell down before, before Paul and Silas and brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? You see, this is what the con... When you begin to get this joy, when you begin to walking in the joy of the Lord, right? When you begin to really and being a part, being with God in that intimacy with him and receiving what he has for you, this is what, this is what even your enemy will say, right? And they said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and be saved and all thy house. So, Father... I just want to pray right now. Father, I just pray for you to send down your Holy Spirit in a powerful way. I pray through your word that has been spoken, you brought faith for us to believe you for the impossible. So, Father, I just pray. Why don't you stand up right now? Father God, I just pray that you just pour out your Spirit upon us. May the joy of the Lord be manifest upon us and stir up that of the fruit of joy within us. Father God, we just need more of you. We can't live our lives the way we're living them now. We need more of you. Lord, we need to come into this place right now because we've been in the chamber hiding. There's been fear that's tried to cripple us. But Father, we confess to you right now, we are no longer going to be walking like the walking dead. We're going to be living in the new creation that you have made us to be. Father God, we remove this thing of being like spiritual zombies right now in Yeshua's name. We pray for life, Lord God, abundance, Lord God, joy of the Holy Spirit. We just pray right now, break everything over every person here that has been the enemy, who has put heavy weights, who have tried to put trips on us. We break those things right now. We take them off our own shoulders. Just take those things off your shoulders right now. All of those things that's been weighing you down. All of those things that have been keeping you from going after God in a powerful way. And we pray for your light and easy yoke to come upon us, Yeshua. The light and easy yoke. And we want to be yoked to you, to walk with you, to get to know you. To know you is to love you. So that we might become more like you, Yeshua, and more like our daddy God. So Holy Spirit, just come right now. Just, just receive, just start crying out to God, more of you, God. More of you, less of me. More of you, God. More, more, more. More of you. More of you. More of you. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Praise you, Lord. Just start worshiping him. Just start praising him. Break that yoke. Put the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness right now. Some of you need to begin to dance before the Lord right now. Don't worry what people think. Just start jumping up and down and, and, and bouncing on that, the enemy's head. Right now in Yeshua's name. Father God, we thank you. We worship you. We just thank you for this new, fresh anointing you're giving us right now of your Holy Spirit. Thank you, Lord. Praise you, Lord. Glory to you, Lord. Woo! Glory, 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 glory. Now, Lord, everything that is needed, you already know. So I pray right now that the things that are needed right now, healing that's needed, right, coming into off of oppression and depression, right now I pray you supply those things in order, according to your riches, Lord God. We are in your presence now, and the enemy cannot be here. Lord God, those things cannot be here any longer, Lord God. The victory is ours, Lord God. We taste the victory, Lord God. We taste a little portion of it tonight. Father God, don't let this be a one-time thing, but let this become a way of life for us right now in Yeshua's name. A way of life where we enter in with you. We begin to dance before you. We begin to laugh. Okay? We just laugh in front of the enemy. Lord God, we just begin to praise and worship you. We begin to sing songs and psalms. We begin to speak things to ourselves, Lord God, of you. We pray for the word of God to become alive in us and be spoken from our mouths. Lord God, give us a holy chutzpah, a holy boldness, Lord God, like never before. I pray an impartation of boldness to speak forth to the people that have been harassing us, 
places. Do not be afraid. We will not cower anymore. We're, we know that you're upon us, Lord God. We will pray for those. We see those who are even those who don't believe will say, I want to pray for you. Lord God, give us that holy chutzpah, that holy, that holy boldness from heaven, Lord God, to be your witnesses of your kingdom, Lord God. In Yeshua's name we pray. Amen and amen. Amen. Now, if there's anybody, you know, I'm, I, I suppose you're going to dismiss, but if there's anybody that needs extra prayer...